my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At face value, we might suspect that Jesus has given himself to despair, has ceased to believe in divine providence. However, these opening words from King David's Psalms are ostensibly placed on Jesus' lips by the author of the Gospel of Mark for the purpose of invoking the entirety of Psalm 22, not just this initial sentiment. A friend recently shared with me that, to him, this phrase is perhaps the most consoling utterance in the entirety of the Gospel. Contained within the scope of Psalm 22 is the decisive movement from the minor to the major key, from desolation to consolation. In fact, choirs sometimes integrate this into their arrangements. Beginning in a minor key, they pivot to a major key midway through. The tone shifts noticeably. Consider these lines where the psalmist declares, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Psalm 22 seems to answer its own question of forsakenness very succinctly in the prophetic perfect tense, a literary device used in scripture that speaks of future events so certain to occur that they're referred to in the past tense. We are given a glimpse of the way God might view the world. In the words of biblical scholar Wilhelm Jesenius, expressing facts which are undoubtedly imminent and therefore in the imagination of the speaker already accomplished. However, where does that leave us in our limited temporal worldview? The hopeful turn in scripture does not alleviate the painful reality of Jesus' passion. That reality begs the question, what are we to do with our suffering? It appears to me an invitation to consider our condition, or rather, the context of our condition as opposed to its content. Father Greg Boyle, a Jesuit priest who works with former gang members, has said that it's the context of love and tenderness that heals, that provides the foundation for hope, not the content of moral preaching. Jesus exemplifies this from the cross. On Easter, our holiest of days, we celebrate the radical presence of God in our midst, in the midst of our suffering and disorientation. Not, for example, the revelations of the Sermon on the Mount. As revolutionary and illuminating as these teachings are, they can't hold a candle to God in the throes of his passion, meeting us where we are. Human beings have a deep, primal, innate longing for this sacramental meeting, to be met in love. That longing can be described as the expectation of benevolence. A theologian, friend, and mentor recently introduced me to this idea that our core issue might be an unconsummated longing for the fulfillment of this expectation this communion with the loving God. If in the pain of living, we suffer the illusion of separateness, we might lose faith in the expectation of benevolence, feeling ourselves exiled from the embrace of God. According to my mentor's idea, this disappointment traumatizes the human person and screens out or dulls the awareness of the presence of God even further susceptible as we are to the noise of our suffering. Trauma displaces the primacy of our identity as beloved of God, and people come to view their experience through the lens of their woundedness. 
former monastic and psychologist James Finley, points to this as our fundamental disorder. Original sin, not as a blight on the soul, but rather as a traumatized capacity to realize ourselves as manifestations of God's presence. One remedy offered by scripture and affirmed by prophets is contemplative practice. Contemplation from its Latin root templum implies a space that has been consecrated for worship. When we adopt a contemplative stance, we're consecrating an internal space in which to dwell for a while. I think it's this sanctuary, this thin place through which epiphany can emerge. In a society bent on productivity, this requires the antithetical of us, that we should bring our heart, mind, and body to a standstill and listen for the murmurings of the spirit. It's in this stillness, this secret cord, that we can hope to be delivered from the power of the dog. Here we are on Good Friday, suspended in the moment before Christ's death and resurrection. In total solidarity with the suffering of humankind, Christ blesses from the cross the presence of lamentation as an integral part of the joy of resurrection. God is still mid-sentence, and we are in the discomfort of our immediate loss, and so susceptible to doubt of the eternal and imminent revelation poured forth by God. What revelation? That God is seeking us incessantly, that God desires always to be woven into the fabric of our being, that God has brought these things to pass and is bringing them to pass and will bring them to pass. It is worth remembering that the infrastructure of God's passion for communion is such that God is good. And the nature of goodness is that it doesn't want to be alone. We receive a hint in the very etymology of the word good. From the Proto-Indo-European root ged, it means to unite, to be associated, to be suitable. What is holy about this day what is good about this Friday is that we are to be united with God who enters into radical solidarity with us through the suffering and ministry of Christ. It seems to me that Christ invokes the entire arc of salvation from the cross, the minor fall and the major lift in naming the primal human disorder the inability to perceive the presence of God in our very being. Jesus models for us the confusion and despair and the hope of life. Jesus faces with us the desolation of estrangement from our very source. Jesus bears witness to our suffering. And so let us bear witness to the God spark the precious word made flesh, the baffled king composing hallelujah in our midst. He is making all things new. Amen.